Logan, I deactivated the security system. Hurry up. Find some place to hide. I'll come in a minute. Let me know when you're inside. Yes, I do. <laughs> oh. Chrome is one of those games that are very close to my heart. One of the forbidden fruits of my youth, spent under the tyrannic yoke of my despotic mother, it is a game that I could only experience while visiting friends from my primary school. Well, actually a singular friend, growing up in the late 90s to early 2000s smack in the middle of the Slavic equivalent of Compton meant that out of 30 kids in my class, only a single one had a computer that could run the thing back in 2004. The game was available with the 104th issue of CD Action, for years the most prominent gaming magazine in Poland. Chrome is a first-person shooter released by Techland in 2003. You take control of Bolt Logan, a mercenary of the future whose previous occupation was not, like the name would suggest, that of a lower to mid tier Gachimuchi star, but a member of Special Forces instead. You know those forces were special because Logan himself looks like a product of generations of incest spliced with fast, and his ex-squadmate, now Merc Buddy, Pointer, is clearly clumsy enough to somehow lose both of his arms. Which makes it even more embarrassing for our protagonist when that clumsy sod somehow outwits him in an act of betrayal meant to leave Logan both dead and to blame for a murder of Mr. Dead Smartass from Octolab. Seeing how his future would either consist of taking it up the arse or having to sign up for Wagner PMC, a tricky question, very likely both, Logan fights his way out with the help of another freelancer, Carrie. A temporary alliance turned partnership sees the two moving to a fringe Valkyria subsystem, an uncharted frontier full of pirates, work for the mercenary type, and coincidentally, far enough to be outside of the lens of our authorities. For now. Because soon the duo becomes wrapped in the ruthless world of corporate intrigue surrounding this game's miracle element, Chrome, and the control of a subsystem suspected to be its equivalent of El Dorado. El Cromado? No, that doesn't work. But before we get into it, we must discuss logistics. First things first, the legal status of Chrome appears to be that of an abandoned ware. Which is a little weird considering the fact that, as far as I am aware, all future in-house engines of Techland were named after this bloody game. The whole topic of abandonware and legal ramifications of it is murky at best and, frankly, I'm not a fucking lawyer. Thank God. No, the reason I mention that is as follows. As far as I am aware, not a single person officially maintains this game. It's no longer available on Steam, it's not available on GOG. So what, you'd ask? You don't get it, do you? I'll spell it out then. The last operating system this game worked semi out of the box was Windows 7, hallowed be its name. Installing Chrome can be a dick in the eye in itself. Running it, however, ends up being a fucking nightmare on Windows 10. Who knows, perhaps on Windows 7 too, given a certain reason I'll mention in a minute. That said, I have no way of testing that theory. Just like some of my favorite games, the only reason this game can be made playable nowadays is due to unpaid work of enthusiastic modders who put work into it. The original Chrome engine was written in Java. The early 2000s Java. To a layman, this won't mean a thing. To a programmer who had a displeasure of working with Java even just 10 years ago, not to mention 20 years ago, you probably just got ever so paler, and that's where I'll stop. I won't get pinned down as liable for your fucking respiratory failure. And if you try to sue me, you'll never fucking take me alive. Aside from the whole operation required to run this thing, there's one more issue I alluded to earlier. Behold! Chrome has run on a 2020 built PC. Okay, this isn't entirely clear. Notice the footstep sound. Did you see how much time did it take for Logan to move? 
It would seem as if each time Logan is meant to move, he needs to build momentum. For some reason, on modern machines, it takes forever to do so. Each movement direction change takes significant time to execute. And as some pointed out, because of this, the movement feels slippery, like shitty ice physics. Right, with that done, let's get back to... What the fuck? Oi! Oi, come from the future! Huh, will I get laid before turning 30? Not that far. Anyway, to any fucking clown telling me, just rebind the fucking keys was the problem. Well, smart ass, the fucking keybinds reset to default with each fucking load. I would know, cause the button I usually use for capturing clips happens to be the fucking quick load. <laughs> right. Yeah, this shit's borderline unplayable. Do you know why? Because the physics really dislike being run at higher than 60 frames per second. Do you know what is the most reliable way to circumvent that issue? You have to get a hold of a third-party software, which gives me heebie-jeebies each time I look at it, by the way, that forces frame rate not to exceed 60 frames per second. And it still doesn't make the issue go away completely. This is a good moment to shout out Outcast Max on Twitter, whose help was invaluable. I mean, for fuck's sake, can you imagine how much of a pain it is to Google technical fixes for an obscure game from 2003? That shares a fucking name of probably the most popular internet browser software out there. Yeah. And you know what? Even with help, with prior instructions, installing this STILL took me like four fucking hours of combating my PC. Yes, I am frustrated. Go fuck yourself! Yeah, let's get this out of the way. The character models. Oh, good grief. The character models. Don't get me wrong, the texturing is pretty decent for early 2000s. No, no, the main problem are the faces. Ever heard of an uncanny valley? That's when you look at something that looks strikingly human but off enough to fire up the same reactions as if you were looking at a corpse. These models had not ever been nowhere near the uncanny valley, and this is the least mean way I could say that. Interestingly enough, however, the lip syncing is not bad. Decent even, especially when you compare it to, hmm, oh, let's say a game from 2008. <laughs> In the jogging mood, eh? That bodes well for your recovery. I'm Lebedev, the group leader, and I'm responsible for- Otherwise, the character animators are rigor mortis grade of stiff. Well, unless we're talking the actual rigor mortis, because- <laughs> <laughs> What I'm trying to say is, I miss the early 2000s ragdolls. Seriously, look at it. This isn't- oh, my shoulder. This isn't- ah. This is straight up- Sometimes, even better, it's... Chrome is often said to fall into the cyberpunk genre due to futuristic themes and cybernetic enhancements present throughout the game in the form of Logan's implants. But later about that. What do you think when you hear cyberpunk? A good chance is dingy, overcrowded cities, seedy back alleys, net runners, yada yada yada. Not a single one of these are present in Chrome. The Alkyria system is on the fringes of human colonization, a borderland, uncharted frontier of corporate interests. As such, most of the environments you will find yourself in are natural, mountainous, winding paths, forests, tropical forests, an odd desert canyon or snow-covered plains in case of Isgard. It's amongst these natural landscapes that you will navigate through various installations of corporate or colonist interest. The buildings of monolithic concrete, nearly brutalist in aesthetic. 
It's extremely functional, is me point. And if you still clamor for your cyberpunk neon, you impatient little shit, behold, signs. Computer screens. Whatever the fuck this is. It's an interesting aesthetic, to be honest. It's as if those screens are a high-tech reminder that countless miles across the uncaring void of space, there is a high-tech society with its middle class living in some degree of comfort. But you aren't of their world, are you now? I've also noticed a few small details. Even though, yes, a lot of interiors are made out of the same base assets, there is often a good degree of color and decal work to give these areas some character. Mind you, I don't say distinguishing features. The assets are blatantly copy-pasted. Still, someone cared enough to bother. The sizes of the maps are pretty damn impressive for 2003. Overall, the visual side is a very mixed affair, but that's mostly due to the character models. Which is a shame. The game has some interesting aesthetic to it, with its clash of futuristic technology against the brutal industrial efficiency of it gets the job done attitude. Before we move further, I need to point one thing out. The main many. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they just don't do them like this anymore. It's the small things. The smooth flight of the camera, the different angles focusing on pieces of the cockpit that vaguely connect contextually to which sub many we are dabbling with. Man, it's charming. One thing that gives me a pause is the lack of credits. And believe it or not, we will get back to it. But for now... The audio. Oh, oh dear, the audio. For the longest time I remembered the music and the original Polish voice acting with great fondness. Some of the sound effects, despite being very clearly stuck, I still associate with Chrome as well. The game's music and SFXs were done by Paweł Błaszczak, with the latter also helped by Michał Reinert. By now, Błaszczak has a long history of composing video game music, including the soundtrack of the original Witcher and a lot of more recognized Techland games. And Chrome, however, is strangely absent from his website, which I really don't get. The soundtrack of Chrome is fucking amazing. The music seems to take heavily from spy and action fleeks at times, while blending typical orchestration with synthesized sounds, especially in the lower registers, to bring them further into this gritty cyberpunk future of corporate warfare. It's executed tastefully, setting the mood just right most of the time. Whether it's a teeth-grinding escape, tactical entry, or unfolding the pieces of the grander conspiracy. Unfortunately, neither Spacon nor us managed to break the security code to the database. But what we do know is where to look for the key code to this data. On one of Zetrox's orbital space stations. Whoa, Nelly, hold on a minute. We're not breaking into any space stations. Yeah, that's not our thing. Like I say, the soundtrack of Chrome is amazing. When it's playing. One thing that hit me like a track was how silent this game can be. Even weirder, a lot of areas lack any kind of ambient background sound to reinforce your surroundings, and you are left with only the sounds of your footsteps for a significant amount of time. 
I lampooned Clear Sky earlier, but let's give Stalker games justice. They have amazing soundscapes. They are really fucking great overall. So, jokes on you if you commented a string of swears at me for taking the piss earlier. Thanks for the engagement, you fucking loser. It becomes even more jarring when you consider how some of the music cues behave, appearing out of nowhere for a one minute thrust, leaving you cold, confused, and unsatisfied in the middle of the night. Which is one thing you shouldn't have taken up to your father. Even a long languid drone would do a lot to fill the space, because as it stands, the moment the music ends, it feels so deflating. Unless whoever implemented the audio, which it needn't had been Błaszczak to give the benefit of the doubt, had an orgasm denial fetish. In which case, mission fucking accomplished, you bloody weirdo, my boner is thoroughly gone. You twat. The weapons, though. Yeah, they sound pretty fucking good. Along with janky early year 2K ragdolls, they sell these guns to me. Now, maybe you notice how I remembered this game for the music and voice acting. If you didn't, OI! WAKE UP! Yeah, the Polish dubbing of this game follows early 2000s trend we had here. That being the Polish dubs being really fucking good. Czy ty zawsze musisz coś podejrzewać? Dzięki temu ciągle żyję. Żyjesz, bo ja zapewniam ci profesjonalne wsparcie. Tak, tak, nieważne. Nie ładujmy się w korporacyjne gierki, to nic dobrego. Logan, 100 tysięcy i wiemy dokładnie, gdzie go trzymają. Prosta sprawa, wchodzisz, zabierasz jajo głowego i wychodzisz. Ty i twoje naiwne opinie. Zapomnij o tym, co masz na ekranie i użyj nosa. Nie czujesz, jak ta sprawa śmierdzi? The English dubbing of this game closely follows the early 2000s trend of English dubs of Central Western European titles as well. Because it's fucking rubbish. Thanks again. I'll never forget this. You should really get some regular protection. They'll be back, you know. We've discussed this with Spacom. Logan, I hope you can hear me. I can see several cannibals moving toward you. Don't those guys ever give up? Oh God, we're not prepared to defend ourselves. Pin them down and keep them in the ravine so they can't reach open ground. If they break through, you're dead. Okay, I'm a little too harsh. The dubbing isn't on English gothic levels of trash. Oh my fucking God, please stop. How'd you manage to track them down? I've got connections. So did you find out more about those blueprints? Nothing more than what was officially stated by Octolab. You might wonder right now, why is Logan sounding like a discount Duke Nukem trying desperately to assert his dominance in the showers? And why didn't John St. John pester them like he did Gianni for making shitposts? Because that is John St. John. No, I'm not fucking joking. I know his voice is iconic and uh, that he was a prolific name in the industry, along the people like Lani Minella, which by the way, oh hi Lani Minella, but going for this voice strikes me as very fucking lazy, I have no other way of putting it. To be fair, the more I play the game, the more I get used to it, I guess. And it's not the worst performance in the game, I mean... You're a murderer, I can see it in your <sighs> But as someone who heard the original voice for years, this change made me realize some things I never did before, which I will delve into later when I touch upon the plot. For now I'll just say that this changes a lot in how Logan is perceived. I know I'm harping on about it, but this actually bothers me to a point I contacted Gianni to basically replace all Logan's lines to fit the original direction more. Then Gianni gave me his prices. Then I looked into my bank account. Then I remembered that I live in a country governed by a bunch of spastic howler monkeys. Chrome has a number of early 2000s first-person shooter traits. Running into a small group of enemies without consideration for resources or cover is suicidal. 
I must point, Chrome was developed and released before the onset of Call of Duty 2's regenerating health system. Of a blight that it truly is. At the same time, it's not an old school shooter with health pickups scattered around the levels. I mean, sure, you can find the med packs, uh, health extras in the wild, but they don't work the way games like Blood or Doom would have you thinking. Heltex needs to be deliberately used by the player, after which it will apply regeneration to player's health. Painfully slow and incremental regeneration, I might add. So don't think these are your get out of the grave cards. They might help you survive a close call encounter if you take out the baddie fast enough. Ah, but this is the rub. Each hit you receive throws your aim off. Additionally, the aiming system does not encourage pedal to the metal attitude of dispensing lead. Although I'm not sure if anyone bothered passing the memo to the enemies. Chrome was the first shooter that I had experienced to have an inventory system. It's a grid system, although said grid isn't uniform. It consists of multiple compartments to fit your weapons, ammo and utilities. I've never found inventory Tetris too asinine myself, but I know some people complain. Should have complained on not having grown up with one of these instead. There's a good number of weaponry, each fitting one of the five categories. Although you will mostly focus on the conventional guns, fitting under the free key. This can lead to slight inconveniences. You could, for example, run around with both a shotgun and a C9 submachine gun. Both are accessed with the same button that cycles through. Oh Christ, the fucking C9A5 SMG. This thing is a bane of my existence in the early missions. It's a 9mm submachine gun with somewhat low damage per shot, which is compensated by an incredibly high rate of fire coupled with a 50 round magazine. If enemies catch you in close range and more than one has this thing, kiss your ass goodbye. They are surprisingly accurate laying down sustained fire with this fucking thing. Unlike you. Well, okay, unlike me at the very least. I very much prefer the kind of weaponry that promotes semi-automatic fire and a degree of self-control, focus, which in early game is provided by Matson Kaffs, the futuristic, seemingly commercial standard of a ballpup assault rifle. It's not my favorite, but I recognized its immense worth as a workhorse in this playthrough. I say futuristic, but to be fair, most of the guns of Chrome are surprisingly grounded and the only ever so outlandish element of their design is usually a counter displaying how many rounds in the magazine are left. Which by the way, the HUD is uh, peculiar. Left side is dedicated to navigation. It's there where you will find a minimap along with rough information on how far you are away from a map pointer. Which you can manually set wherever you want, by the way, and can be immensely helpful with navigation in the dense tropical forest. Fuck off! The right side houses information of immediate importance. Red bar is your health. Green, ammo remaining in the magazine. This number, by the way, is uh, how much ammo you have left for the current weapon in general. Blue represents your neural capacity. Wait, what? I don't see any blue. Oh, that, that's because unlike for the other two, seeing blue is not a good thing. Neural capacity bar is filled with the use of Logan's A's in the sleeve, implants. I mean, this game isn't considered a cyberpunk for no reason. Throughout the game, Logan gains access to 7 implants total. They aren't available all at once, and they will use your neural capacity fast. The narrative reason? Logan's implants are fresh and still in the process of assimilation. Fair enough, my suspension is disbelieved. Wait, what? Each mission pushes this assimilation further, lowering the consumption of Logan's neural capacity and unlocking more implants over time. The implants provide one edge to tip the scales in their favor, assuming they can manage the neural capacity. What happens if you overload? You fry your interfaces. Well, it's not as dramatic as it sounds. All implants shut down, you receive minuscule damage, and most problematically, believe it or not, you acquire a killer fucking migraine. Overall, yeah, implants are fun to play around with. They remain a tool to tip the edge in your favor without being too overpowered or useless. Not until late game, I suppose. What fucking annoys me is how activating the implants require the use of a fucking train commute.
in fucking California. For context, I'm left-handed. I use the mouse with my left hand while right operates the keyboard. The bulk of controls is uh, roughly around here. The implants are activated with numpad keys. Okay. Now, use item is E. To cycle free usables, you use these two fuckers. What the ever? Actually, I forgot one implant. The hacker interface. Yes, Chrome has a fucking hacking minigame. But it's in the form of a memo, so I suppose I shouldn't complain, seeing how we played this too young for our own supposed good. Yes, Senator, I do say this did help us develop cognitive skills, you decrepit, joyless fuck. The minigame is simple, although you do have a limited number of moves, and seeing how hacking is an implant are naturally under the time limit. Although the designers do spice things up from time to time, the AI isn't good. It's incredibly inconsistent, and on top of that, certain behaviors appear to be heavily scripted. For example, this grenade throw. Yeah, I don't remember the enemies throwing grenades. Not without a very suspicious degree of consistency. Then again, maybe I shouldn't complain. NPCs are incredibly inconsistent, most specifically their detection routines. No, I'm not mentioning Clear Sky a fucking again. I lied. Can you tell that I've been going for Clear Sky on Twitch around the time of writing this script? If you engage the enemy NPCs at a distance, there is a good chance they might not recognize they are under fire until getting hit. And even then, they are likely to become alerted rather than immediately rushing to attack you. This makes some sense when I use suppressed weaponry. Less so when I go ham with a fucking Bjorn. Uh, what is Bjorn? Well... At the same time, snipers tend to see you across large distances through the kind of foliage density of which makes you scream for Agent Orange. Other times they seem preoccupied in their thoughts, patiently awaiting for you to complete the installation of a new vent into their thick fucking skulls. This inconsistency itself can be annoying, yes. It gets worse. We will return to the topic. The scanner is a short-range device used to detect biological entities. In less pretentious words, if it's alive, it will show up. It's good for determining rough direction towards the enemy, but it's not the most reliable of methods. It seems that the vertical range of the device is significantly shorter than its horizontal one. It's not a motion tracker either, by the way. If the enemy stands still, they will still show up. Oh, I mentioned Agent Orange worthy vegetation earlier, right? Yes, uh, well. I should talk bugs. Humor me for a minute as I show and explain just a few of the bugs I had encountered. Once you stop using binoculars and have more than one weapon in your inventory, the game will decide that you, in fact, wanted to swap to the other weapon. Which is particularly frustrating when I try to be a cheeky fuck and snipe through dense foliage. If you ever decide to exit your walker, I suggest watching where you step. For a few sessions of recording the footage, I had a bizarre bug in which, upon hitting two grenades left, Logan would refuse to throw any. I actually think I know what is happening there, and that description isn't accurate. What seems to have kept happening was the ammo counter of the grenades ignoring the fact that I threw my final two. The weapon animations ignored that as well, cause look, Logan pulls out a grenade I shouldn't have, and the existential crisis thus commences. We just still, after some point it just stopped happening. Now that I complain, it, it just... It just makes it even weirder. Once I decided, nah, screw the old saves from months ago, I'll delete them to avoid making a mess for myself. Yeah, don't fucking do that. For some reason, whatever saves I made in the same session were bricked. Actually, it literally bricked every single save. Believe me when I say, it somehow interfered with how any loading worked. The issue subsided only once I located and erased the files on my drive. You know, just to name a few off the top of my head. 
Initially, this video was meant to heavily borrow from CV in its format. And that is to say, I would lead you, gentle viewers, across each significant event that happens during Chrome's campaign and discuss things on the fly. Unfortunately, the start of 2023 turned out to be a shit show. In short, Deadline's health and one case of painting pedantism gone rampant. Also, I found out just how difficult it is for me to write a script for such a video. I had serious concerns for the pacing and the flow. The writing of Chrome is fairly competent, if on level of 80s action movies sometimes. If not for nostalgia, I'd say there wouldn't be anything to tickle my pickle. Well, maybe aside from the banter. Well, it wouldn't be the first time that you botched your own plan. Very funny. The story begins with two ex-Spec Force operatives turned mercenaries, Logan and Pointer, en route to the planet Zorg. <laughs> anyway, the mercenaries find themselves en route to the planet that could have been named only by that egomaniacal prick from the Fifth Element. Some guy from Octolab got nabbed by an unknown party while transporting some top-secret blueprints. An easy job, get in, find the blueprints, get out, and if the corporate smartest is still alive, that calls for a bonus. The two find themselves separated, with Logan making sure that nothing surprises Pointer's rear. Pointer, we've got strange company. A woman. Logan becomes distracted and, sure enough, Pointer soon shits the bed. You rush to the facility... I said, rush to the facility... What a thrill With darkness and silence Point for me, Logan. Are you nuts? Where are you? I'm getting in our shuttle right now. With blueprints, of course. Perfect job, as always, on my own. You were always in my way, Logan. You thought you were better than me, didn't ya? Back then, on that Japs cruiser, you were just lucky. You bastard, I saved your life. I would have made it without your help. I'm the best, don't you get it? The best! Nobody's better! No one's as crazy, you mean. In this business, the most important thing is one's reputation. You wanted to steal my fire, now you'll pay for it. I left a few trails for the commissioners of the Protectorate to follow. So after you die, they'll think you stole Octolab's blueprints. And Mr. Dead Smartass from Octolab will be someone you murdered. Clever, huh? Your reputation will be toast. And so will you. Bye-bye. Wow, what an insecure bellend. Attempting escape, Logan teams up with Carrie, the mysterious freelancer chick from earlier, with one goal in mind. Getting in between those tits, getting the fuck out and away from the planet obviously colonized by the old world Algerians. This turns the mission into an escort quest. However, Carrie avoids usual trappings of suicidal escortees getting in the way. Shame Logan has an uncanny tendency to call clear literal second before another armed twat strolls in. Let's go. Look, spare me the details, all right? I'll get you to the station at Morbius, leave you there, and we'll forget we ever met. Sure. The sooner we part, the better. A year later of We Should Part Ways Immediately, the duo finds themselves in the Valkyria system in search of mercenary contracts. This system is our cash cow. Look at this. There are more arrest warrants than advertisements. Don't be so excited. What'd you expect? If you'd listened to me over the past month, you wouldn't be surprised. It's you who should be excited. You'll get a chance to use your new implants. Hope you get your money's worth. If they even work, that is. Don't worry about that. A week, maybe two, and they'll be completely assimilated. Let's hope so. We could have bought a new propulsion system, but we're stepping you with a bunch of wires instead. If there's one thing that writing nails, it's the banter between the leads. We don't need special contacts. I can get any info we need. <laughs> yeah, if someone posts it on the notice board. You can't even do that. I have other qualifications. Sure, you can jump, play with your knife, and shoot everybody. Aren't you special? Don't get so nervous. Where's your sense of humor? Which is strong enough to Officer John St. John failing to sound like a badass. 
Yeah, this isn't anything more but exposition. However, I would say it isn't too heavily handed. What surprises me is how after this expository cutscene, we are presented with the cinematic space epic shot of Carrie's ship in space, a canvas for the credit sequence. The surprising thing that I didn't quite catch as a nine-year-old shithead is that throughout this sequence we are accompanied by more than just incredibly somber music. Today we are certain that humanity faces a glorious chance for the future. If you pay attention, you actually hear scrambled chunks of news broadcasts and interviews, and all of them revolve around Chrome. More specifically, it establishes chrome as an incredibly rare substance that uh, turned out to be a catalyst in the process of terraforming planets and, as such, expediting space colonization process. This information is easily missed. The only time chrome is mentioned earlier is in context of some vague political scandal and its astronomical value. After this point, if the substance is mentioned, once again it revolves around its insane worth in hard currency and its consequences. It baffles me. This small piece of information is the small link that explains why it's so fucking valuable and why corporations go bugger nuts over it. To a corporation with sufficient resources, these are means to push for monopolization of space colonization. Not just monetary gain, exponential monetary gain, gain in power and influence. If this wasn't obvious, our duo will find themselves entangled in this absolute shit show. Our first contract comes from a small mining corporation, Spacon. They lost a shipment of mining equipment along with the crew. Pirates are suspected. We are tasked with retrieving two of the most expensive pieces of nanotech, which thankfully happen to have tracker devices on them. Logan lands on the beach of a tropical island somewhere on Herbus. How's it going down there? I'm sweating here on a freaking beach. I highlight this for a reason. Listen to the same exchange in the original Polish dubbing. No, jak tam? Smarzę się na tej cholernej tropikalnej plaży. I mentioned earlier how John St. John performance changes how Logan comes off a lot. The writing in the cutscene established that this is an easy job for someone of Logan's skill. JSJ slogan seems perpetually frustrated, I like a better word for it. Pavel Orlański slogan is calm, collected. Yeah, he complains about the tropical climate, but it's no reason to lose his temper over it. This slogan is a professional. He's not a fucking roided badass that screams game over man when shit's actually going down. This mission is a fucking routine to him. Same comparison could have been noticed earlier in his conversation with Pointer at the very start of the game. JSJ's slogan comes off as doubtful at the very least, nervous if you stretch. Orleanski slogan? That's a routine for him. He goes into the action with a fellow ex-Special Forces operative with whom he shared countless engagements before. Even when pointing out to his partner how he's becoming too cocky, he sounds more disappointed in Pointer. That is not to say that Polish slogan is one note. He's a professional with a modicum of self-control. He comes off very naturally overall. Well, maybe I am too harsh on John. After all, original Logan's voice actor is an actual theatrical actor, shitty soap operas on TV notwithstanding. Come on, man's gotta feed his family. You can support me on Patreon under John St. John's background is only that of a radio DJ, from what I've gathered. So yeah, he's quite at the disadvantage. Just so we are clear, okay, I recognize John St. John's contributions to the medium of video games. I recognize the importance of John Romero's, but that won't change the fact how he is also responsible for fucking Die Katana. Logan retrieves the containers under 5 minutes, but one thing bothers him. Scans of the island shows a massive seemingly decrepit installation, so Logan asks Carrie to find more about it. I'm afraid it's not just some old junk. Spec Force units are trained to use installations like this for sabotage. With stuff like this, one could cause interference with a flight path. For example, the Spacon ship. Turns out he was correct with his hunch. The installation is fishy. And moreover, the group of meteorologists responsible for it is led by another ex Spec Force operative. Jurgen Dexon. Jurgen. His name. 
is pronounced Jorgen! Quick haggling with Spake and later, Logan's mission is extended to taking out the troublesome installation and hunting down Dexon. Logan infiltrates the installation, says the charges to blow up the cooling system aiming to cause a meltdown, and then wonders how is he going to reach the speeders parked across the island. Thankfully, a pair of moogs kindly help us with their car. Dexon wasn't present on the island, but Carrie points Logan to another one, suggesting he's likely to be there. I hate this mission. I hate the sniper towers hidden in a dense forest. I'm the I hate the beat for the trees. For some fucking reason, they're speaking Vietnamese. Getting Dexon's pawn stash from Admin is fine, but that's actually fun to play. Not good. The alarm must have tripped. Oh, for fuck's sake! I used to hate this warehouse gauntlet, but, you know, after years of agonizing rectal pain, it's no longer such a problem anymore. Then we encounter our first boss, Dexon. Dexon seems taken aback a little at first, saying it's Logan that came for him. The two exchanges bravados and threats, then we begin to battle him. But first... There is a bit of a motif that I noticed, especially in conversations between Logan and his old associates. And by that I mean that, to me, they all come off as trying to project their own penis envy on Logan. <sighs> I am so much better than you always had been. You cannot defeat me. Oh, I know your weaknesses. When you read the script as is, Logan's response can usually be summed up with whatever, I've got a job to do and being an insecure twerp isn't in its description. I swear, this is the last time I harp on John St. John because it feels like this nuance of the character was completely lost in translation. As a direct result, these conversations come off as... Oh, well... Hey buddy, I think you got the wrong door. The leather club's two blocks down. Fuck you. Ah, oh, fuck you, leather man. Maybe you and I should celebrate here on the ring if you think oh, yeah? that off. Yeah, if you get a wrestle. Your ass. Ass. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's okay, man. Let's go. Why don't you get into that leather stuff? I'll strip down out of this and we'll celebrate here in the ring. What do you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah no yeah. problem. You got it. You got it. Get out of that uh, jabroni outfit. Yeah, smart ass. I'll show you who's boss in this gym. After showing Dexon who is the boss in this gym, Logan makes a rookie mistake. He lets his assassination target speak. And the quick save button is F5, by the way. Uh, why do I mention that? Uh, no reason. Oh no, Dexon is escaping on a slow transporter flying low. Whatever will I... Oh, hi, GL Dragon. After a job well done, Carrie tries to crack Dexon's database, which yields barely any results. The encoding is uncharacteristically strong for a group of ordinary pirates. Hmm. What little she does manage to pull out of it, however, indicates Dexon had a hand in kidnapping Professor Bernard Shipkov. Shipkov. It's a Slavic adjacent surname. It's Shipkov. Shipkov is a scientist working for Cortex, Spaken's competitor. The pay for getting the nerd out is really good, but Logan smells a rat. Ah, uh, yes, maybe this is too much for us. Oh, wait, here's something easier you might like. We'll order transport of industrial waste. Very funny. In the end, Logan agrees, demanding Carrie to get every single possible piece of information. Maps, scans, security detail, repo- Oh, a laser fence. Oh, the generator keeping it up leaks radiation like Three Mile Island. Oh, ceiling Shit. turrets. Professor Shabkov? What now? I'm here to rescue you. Rescue me? Are you from Cortec? No, I'm a mercenary. Got a problem with that? No, no, not at all. Couldn't it wait a couple more days? What? How am I supposed to work when everyone keeps bothering me? You fucking what? Okay, there is a car at the exit. This should be easy from the... Fuck, reinforcements swarm the landing pad. Shit, new LZ. Fucking shuttle. Fucking snipers. Oh, fuck. Carry. Carry. Carry! So anyway, we extract Shipkov. One domestic violence incident later, Spaken calls. What'd they lose this time? The colonists in employ of Spaken, mining in search of chrome on Turban, have problems. 
Some bunch of punks calling themselves Hannibal's no, I will not glance over their distinct shortage of war elephants. Anyway, some punks target turban colonists and, as of recently, stole a vital piece of equipment and kidnapped the daughter of the colonists' leader, John Brown. Retrieve them both! Walk into park, what the fuck? Logan, I examined the entire area. The camp's guarded just like the Protectorate headquarters. Knowing that beforehand, I take suppressed weapons for a spin. The plan? Circle the entire valley, create distraction, and while the bulk of the gangers focus on the newly engineered crater, whisk the kid and the MSM away. Bringing attention to yourself isn't worth the trouble, but at the very least, you aren't going to fail the mission if you are detected. I mean, with the AI this inconsistent, just imagine how much of a fucking cancer that would be. The kid and what is essentially a big battery on wheels are returned to the settlement. Hannibals, however, while still failing to mount a proper charge of war elephants, decide to commit to a full-scale assault on the colony. Now! They help the colonists organize a makeshift barricade in the ravine and to fend the gangers off. This is one of the missions where too many allies dying is a failure condition. This is also my favorite one in the entire game, linear and scripted as it is. There's just so much fucking action and the punks go for an overkill. The mission ends with an arrival of an AB-8, a heavy walker, fitted with grenade launchers. Take it out and gang's leader gets out for the second boss fight of the game. With that piece of shit pulverized and smug despite it, Logan can no longer stand how this entire thing reeks, but... Gary, you there? Logan, there's no steak on anymore. What are you talking about? Somebody killed. Killed who? Everyone in Spacon headquarters. He can't keep getting away with it! This is the point where the corporate espionage angle of the plot kicks into full gear, and this is where I'll stop. Not because it's a must-experience thing. It is well done enough. It's more because this video is already way too fucking long, lol. Oh, actually, I will mention two missions that directly follow the Hannibal's War Elephant-less assault. With Spaken wiped out, Logan and Carrie are hired by Cortex to steal the code key that should crack Dexon's database. The key is stored on an orbital station belonging to Zetrox, one of the corporations vying for control of the Valkyria system, apparently behind Dexon and the Hannibals. In order to retrieve it, Logan has to infiltrate a Zetrox base on Herbus, steal the pilot uniform, the shuttle, and the access codes to the station, then infiltrate the station covertly. Stealth is not optional for these missions. Even more than a decade later, I still lack both patience and testicular fortitude to deal with this bullshit. So here's the code to skip these two. The second half of Chrome's narrative is weaker overall. It's still mostly competently written, it's the execution and gameplay that I find questionable. I'd say it feels rushed, which is weird, because Chrome's release was actually delayed at least once. What I do like is that, under the overall surface level story, Logan undergoes a degree of personal development, even though at the same time motivations for his actions remain vague enough to justify game's multiple endings. Yeah, the game has three endings. As the finale draws close, Logan has to choose which side of the raging conflict he intends to assist. What a mess. What do you think about all this? I'm gonna get some sleep. <laughs> I'll just say that in case of two of them saying congratulations plastered across the screen, it feels like the game mockingly asking if you are proud of yourself. Oh, and the third one commits the sin of a sequel bait. But I guess not as blatantly as some others. It's not subtle, but I don't feel I'm beaten over the head with an inflatable horse knob of baseless self-confidence, so that's good. Chrome has signs of ambition and the passion of its creators at Techland. The story is nothing to dwell too long on, but is executed competently, even if it strays towards campy a lot of times while keeping an unshakably straight face throughout. Gameplay follows the trends of the time, encouraging slower, more thought-through engagements, at the same time selling you the weaponry you wield with sound, balance and ridiculous janky ragdolls. But I will not deny, the game has a lot more problems than I remembered. 
The fact it's basically unplayable without limiting your frame rate, not to mention extensive modifications that need to be done in order to run it in modern resolution and on modern systems, is very troubling. I didn't remember experiencing so many strange issues in gameplay as well, to a point I'm wondering if some of the fixes I had to apply are to blame. Alas, I do not have any physical copy of the original Chrome. Shout out to this channel, whose footage of Chrome in original Polish dubbing was the only one that I could possibly utilize for this video. So, do I recommend the game? I mean, it's abandoned where, so technically it's free. No, not really. Unless you are nostalgic for this particular one, I don't see much reason to visit it, sadly. That's not to say I didn't enjoy my return to Valkyria. I did. A, a lot, actually. What I'm saying is, making it work and some of its issues are enough to outweigh any potential gain if you aren't invested in the story already. It's a good game, marred with issues, that isn't doing anything too special or interesting if you consider the gaming landscape of the time. Unless you consider mixing certain elements together as such, in which case, fair enough. Outside of the enjoyment or experience, speaking as a game developer, I can't even say I learned much more other than being brutally shown how the lackluster soundscape of the environments can drag the experience down, or how certain decisions regarding audio triggers can end up incredibly jarring or awkward. If you recall my review of Cult Heretic Kingdoms, that game, despite nauseatingly dull combat overall, had some interesting experimental ideas for mechanics and exceptionally developed narrative and world-building elements for its genre. If you don't recall that review, how could you? Nay, nay, how dare you? Anyway, despite being a mediocre gameplay experience, Cult did few things differently and uniquely to its peers. Chrome, unfortunately, doesn't have anything of sorts. Which is a real fucking shame. Chrome is a good game, but good is often not enough, especially with these kinds of drawbacks. Honestly, I hoped to end this one on a less somber note. But no worries, the next one is... Oh, for fuck's sake! This video was way more than I bargained for. Thanks for watching it until this point. I hope this one in particular was worth the wait, cause I sure as hell am anxious about the result myself. Please do let me know in the comments. I must admit an L here. I fucked up with logistics and that definitely increased the production time of this one. Shout out to venerable patrons supporting me on Patreon. Glenn Uno, Guiderino, Łukasz Barański, Mefcio, Piotr. By the way, thanks for showing me how to batch convert the audio files, it helped a lot. And Drunken Slav. Also shout out to people who helped me making this one. Especially Nomad and Crow, the two people I keep forgetting to shout despite the fact they helped me proofread my scripts. It must be very frustrating to make sure grammar and stuff checks out, only for Schwalbe to mispronounce shit so catastrophically. Now, uh, if you excuse me, I will have a bit of a drinking. Lord below knows I need it. <laughs>